Well, Dr. Emmons, thank you so much for um, taking the time to talk to me. And I have so much to ask you about all these years, your journey to be the pioneer of integrative mental health, integrative psychiatry. And uh, some of my audience probably still um, do not know so much about your work. Would you mind just give us a little brief introduction of what you have accomplished? So I'm, goodness, for 40 years, I've been a psychiatrist. I'm also a child and adolescent psychiatrist. And before I went to medical school, I was an infantry medic, and that's where my love of medicine was born. Um, but about a year into it, I realized I didn't like being shot at. And so I got retrained as an x-ray technician and developed a passion for medical imaging. As our professors used to say, how do you know unless you look? And in 1979, I was a second year medical student and someone I loved tried to kill herself. And I took her to see a wonderful psychiatrist. And I came to realize if he helped her, it wouldn't just help her, that ultimately it would help her children and even her grandchildren as they would be shaped by someone who was happier and more stable. So I fell in love with psychiatry and have virtually loved it every day for the last 43 years. But I fell in love with the only medical specialty that virtually never looks at the organ it treats. And back then I knew it was wrong. I knew it would change. I actually hated the term mental illness because when you call someone mental, you shame them. Um, and they weren't mental illnesses, they're brain health issues. And so when I had the opportunity in 1991 to start looking at the brain with a study called SPECT, S-P-E-C-T, so excited. And we've now built the world's largest database of brain scans related to behavior, over 200,000 scans on patients from 150 countries. And the scans taught me the brain is an organ, just like your heart is an organ. And if your brain is having trouble, you're going to have trouble in your life. And when I started looking at the brain, I realized some of the medications we prescribed were toxic to brain function, especially benzos and opiates. And remember in medical school, they taught us first do no harm, use the least toxic, most effective treatments. And I realized I had to get someone's body healthy because it supports your brain. And that's where the whole integrative psychiatry came in. Um, and it's been just great fun through the years. Well, as we started looking at the brain, we began to realize some very important things that how most doctors make psychiatric diagnoses is archaic. Um, in fact, the DSM, I hate the name, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which completely has no neuroscience. Right. And, and I think of myself as a clinical neuroscientist because I want to study the brain and then I want to optimize the brain. And um, I hate the term mental illness because it shames people it's stigmatizing and it's wrong. Yeah. Um, they're brain health issues. Right. And it's one of the reasons I love acupuncture because acupuncture tends to balance brain function. Uh, it's one of those great things for pain that calms down the pain centers, but actually increases blood flow to the front part mm -hmm. of the brain. It's perfect balancing when, when it works like we hope. Um, I learned that diet matters, that if you eat, eat right, you tend to think right. I learned that traumatic brain injury is a major cause of psychiatric problems 
And very few people know about it because psychiatrists don't look at the brain. Um, I learned the importance of sleep because when you sleep, your brain washes itself. And if you're not sleeping right, you won't think right. I learned that Alzheimer's disease starts in the brain decades before you have any symptoms. So we should be preventing Alzheimer's disease our whole lives, given that 50% of people 85 and older will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. I realized that marijuana is not really great for the brain. I published a study on a thousand marijuana smokers or users. Every area of their brain was lower in activity compared to our healthy group. And as it's been legalized across the US, um, it's become way more common recreationally. And that's a problem because I think it disrupts development. So 15, 16, 18, 20 year olds using marijuana when their brain isn't actually finished developing until they're 25 or 26. That's a big problem. And as its use has gone up, mental health problems has gone have gone up as well. Well, in the last you know few minutes of your introduction, you have touched a number of very critical concepts. I just want to kind of clarify a few of them. Number one, I couldn't agree with you more about mental illness is actually a brain disease or brain conditions, probably with combined with some maladaptive reaction or response or coping mechanism. But we shouldn't call them mental illness because it does kind of shame people and make them afraid of seeking help. And the second things you're saying, you're absolutely right that we are the departments or medical um, division where don't look into the brain. You know, if you have a heart problem, you go to doctors, they always do a EKG at least on you. But we don't do that when people complaining about their thoughts, their feelings, anything in their emotions. And so you mentioned about the SPEC scan. Can you tell us a little more about SPEC scan? and what it does and how it helps guide a treatment for people. So SPECT, which stands for Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography, is a nuclear medicine study that looks at blood flow and activity. It looks at how the brain works. It's different than a CAT scan or an MRI. Those look at the structure of the brain. SPECT looks at function. And it basically tells us three things, good activity, too little, or too much. And then our job is to balance it. Now, generally, we don't make diagnoses from pretty pictures. We gather a lot of information on our patients and then take that and combine it to what we see on scans to know what to do for the patient. So for example, depression is a very common diagnosis. It tripled during the pandemic and we're passing out SSRIs in this country like candy. Um, before the pandemic, 23% of women between the ages of 20 and 60 were on antidepressant medication. That's a problem. Um, especially when in large scale studies, it's been shown that antidepressants work no better than placebo, except for the most severely depressed. I hate the diagnosis of depression. Why? It's like chest pain. Nobody gets a diagnosis of chest pain because chest pain doesn't tell you what causes it and it doesn't tell you what to do for it, right? I mean, people would think it's absolutely ridiculous to give everybody with chest pain nitroglycerin. Um, depression's the same way. Depression has many different causes from early pancreatic cancer to thyroid illness, to traumatic brain injury, to grief, to persistent negative thinking. 
um, to low activity in the brain to some people with depressed have high activity. And how would you know unless you actually looked? And the idea that we're passing out antidepressants on, on a wholesale basis, right? The nurse practitioner, the physician assistant, the psychiatrist, the family doctor, the uh, OBGYN, the internist are passing these things out with no biological data. And that's why antidepressants have black box warnings. Because if you give an SSRI to the wrong person, you can disinhibit them and hurt them. Now, if you give it to the right person, it could be miraculous. So I'm not opposed to medicine. I'm just opposed to the indiscriminate, non-science-based way that these medications are prescribed. How does SPAC scan help guide the selection of antidepressants then? So if you have, and there are published studies on this, if you have increased activity, especially in the limbic part of the brain and in the ventral anterior cingulate gyrus, SSRIs work beautifully. If those areas are low in activity, SSRIs generally make people worse. And I published a study in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease on predicting treatment response in depression. And if you had low activity in the front part of your brain, very common in head injuries, that SSRIs tended to make you worse. And so, once you know the pattern, you can then target the treat. Um, so if a scan shows that there's evidence of traumatic brain injury and low frontal lobe activity, you wanna use something to stimulate. So there, Wellbutrin uh, could be a better choice for someone. Um, if it shows they have temporal lobe problems, which often go with mood instability, irritability, temper problems, an anticonvulsant is more likely to be helpful. I often put people in hyperbaric chambers uh, to reverse the damage. But how would I know if your brain was damaged if I didn't look? Because on history, what I've discovered is a lot of people, they forget or they don't tell you they had serious brain injuries. So when I first started doing scans, um, I'd like, you know, I'm a military trained psychiatrist. I trained at Walter Reed. So I ask everybody about head trauma because, you know, I worked on soldiers to start my career. But a lot of people would say no, but we would see evidence in their scans. And so I would ask, are you sure? Have you ever fallen out of a tree, off a fence, dove into a shallow pool, been in a car accident, had a concussion playing sports, been in a fight, or have a fall? You cannot believe, Dr. Yang, the number of people who would go, no, no, no. Oh, when I was seven, I fell out of a second story window. Or when I was 12, I fell out of a moving vehicle going 30 miles an hour. Um, and if you don't look, I mean, how, how do you know? And even if someone's had a head injury, it may have healed. SPECT actually predicts, if you get scanned right away and your brain is still healthy, you're gonna do fine from the head injury. But if your brain's not healthy nine months later, you're gonna have persistent trauma problems unless you rehabilitate your brain. And talking about imaging, and um, could you explain to us how the people choose different imaging system to scan their brain, uh, like SPEC scan, PET scan, MRI, CAT scan? So for functional scans, you see MRI, structural MRI and CT are lagging indicators of trouble. They don't show you trouble early that's when you're beginning to lose brain tissue. PAT and SPECT are both nuclear medicine studies. They, PAT often looks at glucose metabolism, SPECT looks at blood flow. 
Um, SPECT is much more common clinically because it's cheaper, it's done in more hospitals around the world. Um, PET is usually reserved for research centers, especially when it comes to the brain. Um, there's also quantitative EEG, and I like quantitative EEG. We actually do it in a number of our clinics because you know no medical specialty should ever rely on one study. And EEG looks at the electrical activity in the brain, SPECT looks at blood flow, and most of the time they sort of go with each other, but not always, because sometimes blood flow and electrical activity will separate. Um, and then there's uh, magneto electroencephalography. It never really caught on because the cameras are so expensive. Um, and then there's some cool new MRI-based techniques, functional MRI, um, arterial spin labeling, diffuse tensor imaging. Um, I'm always looking at what else might be new and interesting, but I just, I love SPECT because I can look at an image and virtually instantly, I know what might be going on in a person's brain. Yeah. I think the um, just from the perspective of patients, what would be the cost of a SPAC scan and uh, would insurance cover that investigation? So insurance often doesn't cover it because it's psychiatry. So why would you look at the brain? And <laughs> That's funny. insurance carriers <laughs> are very interested in quarterly profit, not long term. And getting a scan saves you money over time because you get to the diagnosis faster. And th there's an interesting phenomenon that happens when someone gets a scan. They begin to develop a relationship with their brain. And so they then treat it better after they've seen it. Um, the whole cost for our evaluation is about $4,000, but that includes two scans, our history, our cognitive testing, and so on. I think this the scan by itself is about seventeen hundred dollars. Great, that's very uh, affordable. You know, the cost-effective, um, worthwhile investigation, uh, given the fact how the, the the mental health issues cost our productivities and the quality of life. Um, you mentioned about marijuana, and I really, really want to ask you about this because I saw, I keep showing my patients the scan you put on the website that how the normal brain in comparison with marijuana brain. And the marijuana brain looks has all of the holes in it. And when my patients look at it, they, they, they set them, you know, they take a step back. They're surprised to see such a sharp contrast. Uh, could you kind of elaborate on what has been your experience working with people who use marijuana long term? So I'm not a fan and, and I have no dog in the fight. So let me just start with that. Um, I'm more likely to make money if you use than if you don't use, because if you use, you're much more likely to see me. And when I first started doing scans, because I'm also a child psychiatrist, I would get this whole group of 14, 15, 16 year old kids that look like they had ADD, but they didn't look like they had ADD when they were six or when they were eight or when they were 10. And then I would look at their brain and initially they wouldn't tell me they were smoking marijuana, but their brain looked old. It looked older than they were. And I, I would sit with the teenagers and I'd be like, why does your brain look old? And they go, oh, I'm not doing anything. But as we would sit there and I'd show them a healthy scan and then drug affected scans, they would start crying and said, well, I've been using for about two years now and you won't tell my parents. <laughs> and, and I just saw it consistently, repeatedly. This is like 30 years I've been looking at brains and 
Um, I published a study a couple of years ago on a thousand marijuana users, every area of their brain was lower. And then I published what I think is the world's largest imaging study. It's on 62,454 scans. And we looked at little kids and old people and map how the brain ages on spec. And then we looked at, well, what are the factors that accelerate aging? And because I have this massive database and schizophrenia was the worst, like by far. People who have schizophrenia have the most damage and oldest looking brains. Old here is not a good thing. Um, marijuana was second worse wow. that marijuana actually aged the brain on average about three years and that is not a good thing you don't want an older brain plus my experience and it's been borne out by the research teenagers who use marijuana have a higher incidence of anxiety depression and suicide in their 20s um and i was on a radio show once in san francisco with Michael Savage and the host, Michael said, before we went on, we were chatting for a minute. He said, you're gonna get a lot of haters when you talk about <laughs> marijuana. I said, yes, that's true. I said, but every person who's been heavily using is gonna spontaneously complain of memory problems. And everybody who called spontaneously complained of memory problems and memory is the fabric of your soul. It's what holds us together, connects us to the past, it, to the present, to our hopes for the future, and damage the memory, you damage your life. And funny story, this is actually public knowledge. I've been Miley Cyrus's doctor for a long time. And I was having a heck of a time getting her to stop marijuana. Um, I mean, she named her dog, Mary Jane. So, um, but then I figured out this intervention and I told her about the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is these large structures in your temporal lobes that are involved in memory and mood. And they're very important. And I said, let me tell you about the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is Greek for seahorse. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's a very special structure. Every day it produces about 700 new stem cells or 700 baby seahorses. And you never want to do anything to murder the seahorses. <laughs> because when you use marijuana, it decreases blood flow, which makes it less likely those new stem cells will live. And her eyes got really big and she said, Dr. Heyman, that's so unfair. You know, I'm an animal lover. And I'm like, you're murdering the baby seahorses. I said, <laughs> you want a big hippocampus, you want a big, healthy, you know, two big, healthy seahorses. You, you don't want an old shriveled seahorse. Wow. So it must be hard for you to see that marijuana has been advocated to the young people or legalized and uh, for recreational use and in addition to so-called medical marijuana basically it it helped give them to people with any kind of chronic medical conditions they don't do the simple things first right i mean if you have cancer it's like absolutely that could be helpful to you um, or you have a resistance seizure disorder, but it should never be in the top five things you do. It should be like 12 or 13 that, you know, so many people aren't doing the simple, smart things to help their brain. And, and I would love to know your experience of acupuncture with depression. I'm, you and I share a patient and it was remarkably helpful, which I was so grateful for. Um, I, I send people for pain disorders, uh, for depression, especially if their depression is improved with opiates. 
uh, that I think it's really helpful. But but I would just love to learn more. Thank you. And um, yeah, we will hope to do a separate to get on your podcast talking about acupuncture. But today is your show. I <laughs> want you focus on you. I don't let you get away with my questions. And so for people who cannot get rid of marijuana, I, just like you, I treat the uh, adolescents who have all kinds of behavioral, emotional issues and also uh, learning issues, but they couldn't stop using marijuana. And it is very hard to treat them because you're almost like trying to do something, but they're constantly doing something else to counteracting it. What I start with is your brain is involved in everything you do how you think, how you feel, how you act, how you get along with other people. And when your brain works right, you work right. And when your brain is troubled, for whatever reason, you have trouble in your life. Here's a healthy scan. Here's your scan, which is not healthy. If you don't stop poisoning your brain, it's going to be really hard to be better. And the, the problem that's working against us is society is telling them it's okay. And that's hard. Um, but ultimately, I wanna teach my patients to love their brains. And if you love it, you never hurt it. And, and, and then I try to get into their motivation, which is tell me what you want. I wanna know your goals. And I don't know if you know, but I have a high school course that's all over the world called Brain Thrive by 25. And in it, there's a lesson on things to avoid to keep a healthy brain. And invariably, it's a 14 year old boy, it's never a girl, raises his hand and goes, how can you have any fun? And we play a game with the kids called who has more fun? The kid with the good brain, or the kid with the bad brain, who gets the girl and gets to keep her because he doesn't act like an idiot. The kid with the good brain or the kid with the bad brain, who gets into the college they want to get into, who um, gets the best job, makes the most money. It's the person with the healthy brain. And so fun happens more with a healthy brain. Well, Actually, a lot of people who actually get into the marijuana, sometimes just for curiosity, sometimes a peer pressure, but a lot of times they're self-medicating their anxieties. And um, so without addressing online issues that cause them to use marijuana to begin with, it's very hard to get them off marijuana or other drug they're being used to. Well, it's so true. And I think in second grade, we should teach children how to do diaphragmatic breathing, how to not believe every stupid thing you think. I know both you and I like natural supplements to um, help balance the body and the brain. Um, I, I think it's absolutely true. And a lot of kids who smoke marijuana also tend to be oppositional. Like no matter what it is you say to them, they argue with you. And if you tell them not to do it, they're more likely to keep doing it. And I actually see they're hyperfrontal. So the cingulate gyrus tends to work too hard in this group. And you have to be a little bit sneaky in how you deal with them. So this is where something like reverse psychology can be helpful. And it's like, you know, you probably don't want a healthy brain. And, you know, I think continuing to smoke is probably your best strategy if that's not what you want. And they'll go, what do you mean? It's not what I want. I want a healthy brain. <laughs> um, so you, you almost have to like talk in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you perceive what's happening in the world that marijuana being 
used more widely as some kind of public health threat or you know safety issues because people will be driving you know on the influence of marijuana and all this and that should we be concerned about it absolutely we should be concerned about it if it increases the risk of suicide and we know with the pandemic suicide has skyrocketed i mean that's been our experience at amen clinics we're actually routinely horrified how much we've seen since the pandemic started um and marijuana increases the vulnerability um so yes you know that driving and you know one of the things that's been really awful is there are more and more babies born with marijuana levels in their blood, uh, especially in Colorado. So I read a study where there was like a 1700% increase in the number of babies born, ex you know, with marijuana in their system at birth. Well, who should be responsible for making this type of bad public policy issues? I mean, in Chinese, we have a saying, there's a three kinds of doctors. There's a doctor who treat disease, there's a doctor who treat the person, and the doctor who, you know, managing the public health all around the country to treat the country, treat the nation. And those people, I think, who make public policy, you know, health policy, really have far more good or bad impact on individual health in the society. Well, they came out not too long ago, I guess maybe two years ago and talked about vaping as a public health crisis, but they, had, they didn't talk about marijuana use as a public health crisis. And they're both public health crises. You know, whether people start vaping nicotine, um, you just can't stop. I adopted my two nieces because both their parents were addicts and couldn't stop hurting these kids. And when my 17 year old started vaping, actually she was 16, I grounded her for like five months. I'm like, no, 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 you come from drug abuse. We're not starting with this if you wanna live here. I mean, I was pretty clear, we have to be aligned um, to protect your brain. And people don't see the damage. I mean, and that's for me, that's why brain health is so important. I see the damage that drugs, alcohol, and what it does to children. It's just horrifying because both you and I, you know, we treat a lot of kids who were affected by their parents' negative behavior. And as marijuana go, use goes up, that means more and more babies are going to be born with a toxin in their body. Um, which will delay their development, maybe permanently. Yeah. So let's say if a people uh, wants to stop using it, what could they do that would help them to have an easier time to stop? In our practice, we definitely use acupuncture to help them. We we'll give them nutrients. So what would you do to help them to, to be able to stop? So one of my favorite nutrients is N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine has actually been found in published studies to help people stop addictions from marijuana and cocaine, nicotine, um, alcohol. So 1,200 milligrams twice a day. Um, and, you know, the withdrawal from marijuana is not as awful as some of the other ones because it stays in your body a long time. And so um, education, N-acetylcysteine, along with treating whatever reason they're using uh, has been helpful for us. That's great. And for the people who say they have stopped, but they still suffer from the consequences of it, and what could we do to facilitate the recovery or healing of the brain? You know, one of the things we haven't talked about yet is my favorite topic, which is you're not stuck with the brain you have. You could make it better and I can prove it. And so 
for the damage from drug abuse, whatever it is, stopping. I mean, that's the first principle. You have to stop poisoning the organ or it won't heal, is stopping it and then um, put it in a healing environment. So teach them about food and nutrients and hyperbaric oxygen, acupuncture um, is, is just critical. Um, and to show them. So with this scans, I can actually go, here's your brain today. And if you do what I ask you to do, this is what it's going to look like in four months. But if you don't do what I ask you to do, here's just what it's going to look like next year. So I can give them positive motivation and negative motivation. Um, and I'm so excited because we've done thousands of before and after scans. And when people do the right things, their brain tends to be better. That's great. And uh, talking about, uh, you know, just go back to the uh, mental health issues right now. What do you see the pandemic, the COVID? What do you see the actually the damage to the brain as a result of a COVID or any vaccine injury to the brain or, you know, any observation from your experience? So I have before and after COVID schemes. COVID is definitely not a good thing for the brain. It causes inflammation in the limbic structures of the brain, the basal ganglia, the thalamus, the amygdala, hippocampus, they tend to just start working way too hard. And anti-inflammatory strategies like quercetin curcumins, vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids, hyperbaric oxygen can be really helpful. I have a number of patients who report vaccine damage. I've not seen anything specific yet on scans. There's a study from um, Taiwan on a whole group of people who had migraines after the vaccine. Um, and I tell my patients, your best defense against COVID or now monkeypox is your immune system. Did you know the US has 4% of the world's population, but 16% of the world's COVID deaths. And it's because we're very unhealthy as a society. And, and I was really saddened by the government's response. There was virtually no messaging around, we need to get healthy. Instead, they locked people up and they got fat, right? The incidence of increased obesity uh, was horrifying, especially in young adults, which just makes me so sad um, that, you know, the message is it's your immune system we have to strengthen, not, you know, just be reliant on vaccines, which haven't worked nearly as well as we would have hoped. Yeah, that's great. Um, could you comment on why some people suffer from what they're called a long COVID or chronic COVID versus other ones who do not? And what long COVID, how the long COVID patients um, suffer from the mental health issues? So people have COVID, 20% of them will have a new onset psychiatric illness within the next six months. It's sort of horrible when you think of that. I think it's because of this inflammation in the brain. And they almost get a pseudo dementia uh, pattern, brain fog, memory problems, focus problems, uh, poor energy. And um, strategies to intervene is so important. We've had people become psychotic. Uh, we've had other people get depressed. We've had others be super anxious uh, and doing all the good mental health things we've talked about is important, plus finding ways to cool off their brain. And you know, I think the people who really are vulnerable um, I always talk about the concept called brain reserve. It's what is the brain health you take in to the accident you have? Or what is the brain health you took in to getting COVID? And if 
if your brain was not healthy and then it got whacked with this infection, you're much more likely to have long-term problems. And uh, which is why we need a public health message of it's not mental illness, it's brain health. Um, let's do a revolution in brain health. Actually, my mission is to end mental illness by creating a revolution in brain health. And we can do so much better. Yeah, that's wonderful. And we have a couple minutes left. Would you mind tell us about your new books? I know you have written so many books. Any book you want to recommend to our audience that you think is the most important one? I know everyone is uh, important. <laughs> my new book, You Happier, I wrote um, when I realized Americans are the unhappiest they've been since the Great Depression. And there's a lot of books on happiness, but I have a very different spin. Happiness is a brain function. And if you get your brain healthy, you're so much more likely to be happy. And then there's a whole section on brain typing because what makes some people happy, jumping out of an airplane, makes other people miserable. <laughs> and <laughs> you have to know their brain type, like my spontaneous group, they love surprises um, and hate routine. Where my persistent group hates surprises and loves routine. So know the type of brain, then I talk about supplementing your brain. My favorite happiness supplement is saffron. There are 24 randomized controlled trials showing that saffron is equally effective to antidepressants, but way fewer side effects. Plus saffron helps your memory. It helps sexual function. And I'm like, mood, memory, and sex. I think I'll take this. <laughs> um, That's a good news. <laughs> yeah. So you happier, it's a fun book. And it's really looking at happiness in a biological way, a psychological way, a social context and a spiritual context, which is why do you care? Purposeful people are happier. Purposeful people live longer. And if you give away happiness, notice what you like about other people more than what you don't they're more likely to be happy, which means you will be happy. Well, you, you just inspire me to have you coming back talking about spiritual health and the brand health next time. Please <laughs> accept our invitation. I will look forward to it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Hammond, for your time and for your wonderful sharing of your rich knowledge. And um, I, on behalf of my audience, I will thank you so much.